Hey folks, welcome back for another episode of Code Club. I am really excited to start a new series of episodes with you where I'm trying to help learners, you, <laughs> um, to kind of develop intuition in thinking about how to build a figure or build a plot in R. Um, I find oftentimes people get so caught up in uh, what is the right syntax that they kind of lose the forest for the trees, right? They forget what they're trying to make or what they're trying to do. And so I think you can learn a lot about making a plot uh, by thinking through it. And I liken this a lot to writing, that if I sit down to write a manuscript that I'm going to submit for peer review to a journal, um, I don't open it up and start typing. People do that, and it's really painful to watch them do that. Don't do that. Instead, I like to start with an outline. And so I kind of think through the logic that I'm going to try to tell in the like introduction, the results, the discussion, what methods I need to describe, right? So even just those sections are a bit of an outline. And then I try to kind of flesh it out a little bit more. And then kind of at the end, really, I worry more about the specific words I'm using and the specific plots even that I'm using to convey the message. I've talked about this in previous episodes of Code Club about how I write. Well, about two months ago, um, in my newsletter, did you know I have a newsletter? Down below, there's information on how to subscribe to that newsletter. Anyway, in my newsletter, I have been posting each week a new figure. And I have shown very little code, but I've asked people to look at that figure and to think about how they would generate that figure in R at a very high scale. Not necessarily worrying about things, again, at the minutia of what functions and what arguments and what values to pass to those arguments, but just kind of like at a broad scale, think about like, well, what's on the x-axis? What's on the y-axis? What's the color? Ooh, that's interesting. They're, they got rid of the x-axis on that figure. Or I see that they've got subscripts or superscripts in their axis um, titles, right? How did they do that, right? So those types of questions. And I've been talking people through those things in more of a narrative fashion in my newsletter. What I want to do now with this, uh, with the, with these videos, is to go back um, and and work through actually writing the R code to accompany the narrative that's in the newsletter. So, if you haven't read uh, my newsletter or subscribed to my newsletter, please be sure that you've done that. I'm going to be going back to the newsletter that I published on August 23rd. So this is the newsletter um, that's available on, on my website. Uh, there's a link to this specific uh, issue down below in the description of this video. And you can kind of read through um, the figure and look at the figure and you can kind of think about it yourself. And you can then kind of go through and kind of see my narrative flow of how we did that. At the end here, I have uh, some example code to perhaps get someone going to thinking about how they might generate this figure. Okay. So that's all great. <laughs> Again, we're gonna take that next step now. So this figure comes from a paper called Exploring Novel Microbial Metabolites and Drugs for in Inhibiting Clostridioides Difficile. Uh, it's published in the journal M-Sphere and it was published by Ahmed um, Abokalhair. I'm sorry, I'm sure I butchered that last name, and Mohamed Salim. So again, this is the figure that I'm interested in. They looked at 527 different compounds and 63 of those compounds they deemed as a strong hit because they inhibited growth by as much as, or more than 90%, okay? So that's all I really care to share about the specific story. The link is here, uh, and I'll also provide that link down below in the show notes if you wanna go read the paper. What I'm more interested in is the figure. And so they did a variety of things in this figure that I think were rather interesting. So at a, at a very basic level, what kind of plot is this? Well, it's a scatter plot, right? We have a continuous variable on the x-axis and a continuous variable on the y-axis. Each of the 527 compounds are indicated by a point. The next thing that I think is interesting is that uh, they're not using the default colors and they colored it rather by whether or not it was a strong hit or not, right? So if it was a strong hit, it's kind of that burgundy color, it got kind of this olive color. So that's interesting. The other interesting thing about the color is there's no legend, <laughs> right? Um, so how'd they get rid of the legend? Uh, I'm sure they didn't build this in R, but again, I might think about in R, is there a way for me to get rid of the legend? And there is, and I'll show that to you. The next thing that stands out to me is that the x-axis is relatively meaningless. And in fact, they don't actually show an x-axis. There's no label on the x-axis. So that's interesting, right? Um, 
And I think they had 527 compounds, and they're all kind of equally important. There's no real order to them, if you will. Um, and so how'd they get rid of the x-axis? How do you get rid of the ticks, the axis, the label, all that stuff? Uh, is something that is intriguing to me. Um, also, I'm interested in how did they put this horizontal line um, at zero as a solid line and put another dashed line at about 90%. So we'll talk about that as well as then uh, this y-axis going from negative 100 to 100 and making sure that it looks the same way. Um, if we get to it, one thing I notice is that the points actually fall on top of the line. And I'm wondering if in R, if our points fall on top of the line or uh, behind the line. And normally in R, we have a little bit of gap, a little bit of margin to our axes. And I don't see that here, right? So the points are right up on the axis on the left and right side. They go right up to 100 and right down to negative 100. So how do you do that? So these are all the types of questions we're going to be addressing in this episode of Code Club. Heading over to our studio, I have that example code that I included at the bottom of that newsletter. I'll go ahead and run all this. This isn't the exact data that those authors published. Um, and again, I'm not so concerned about the specific question. I'm more interested in these different elements of the figure that I would like to recreate somehow. So if we look at sim data, we find that we have two columns. We have a compound column and a percent inhibition column, right? So you'll see that I created this data set by creating a vector that is in the percent inhibition column, um, where I have taken a random sampling from a normal distribution of 464 um, um, compounds, right? Or is at least what I'm simulating. And that the mean percent inhibition for those 464 compounds is zero, and there's a standard deviation of 30. Uh, then I added 63 additional compounds down here that have a random percent inhibition between 91 and 100. Now, because as we saw in the figure, the points are all kind of out of order, I, I then needed to randomize the order. And so I did that by running sample on this vector. And so that gets us our percent inhibition column to be in a random order, right? And so then we also have the compound column. Okay, so this is our data, sim data. And so the first thing we wanna think about is making kind of the base level uh, scatter plot. And so we'll do that by piping this to ggplot. And then AES is the function that tells ggplot what column gets mapped to which aesthetic. So on the x-axis, we're gonna have the compound. So we'll say x equals compound, and then y equals percent inhibition. And we'll then say plus uh, geome point. So geome point is the function that we can use to make a scatter plot. And so here we see in our bottom right corner is something that vaguely resembles what they had in their figure. Returning to this, um, I see very quickly that they have a theme that doesn't have grid lines and it has a white background. So I'm gonna go ahead and move to my favorite theme, theme classic, and we might make some tweaks to that along the way. But again, I think this is a good starting place for going forward with the rest of uh, the plot and learning how to make the manipulations that they made. Okay, so the next thing again that we wanna think about is color. And that those things, those compounds that were above 90% got one color and those below 90% got another color. And so I would like to do something here like uh, color equals, let's say strong, right? So is it strong or not, right? But if we run this, it complains because we don't have a strong column. So we need to come back up to our code here and create a column strong. So I can go ahead in my code and pipe this to a mutate. Mutate we use from dplyr to create or modify existing columns. And I can say strong, and I'll say equals, and then I'll say percent uh, inhibition greater than equal to 90, okay? And so now if I look at sim data, I see that I've got strong, right? And so I'm going to, again, recall your attention to the set seed. And so the set seed, if we all run that same set seed and that code, we should get the same data. There might be some differences between say like Windows and Mac and Linux, but I think we should all have the same data now. All right, so now again, we can then plot the data. And sure enough, 
we have mapped strong to color, right? And so now we see across the top those that were, were strong and those in the bottom that were not strong. We also see uh, that there's no x-axis pattern here, right? There's not like the strong ones were at the beginning and the weak ones were at the end or vice versa, but it's randomly distributed across those different compounds like we saw in the figure. Building beyond this basic plot, the next thing I want to do is modify the colors to match, more or less, what they had in the original figure, as well as getting rid of that legend. So we can modify the color in ggplot doing scale color manual. And remember, if you ever want to modify some aesthetic that you're mapping data to, like the color or the x-axis or the y-axis, typically you're going to be in a good, pretty good state if you look for something called scale, whatever that aesthetic is, and then something else, right? So scale x, discrete scale x continuous scale y log 10 these are all different scales or scale color manual right and so now what we're going to give scale color manual are our breaks and the values that we want to apply to those breaks so we can say breaks equals and we have a false and we have a true and then we have values and we're going to have uh, two values for those colors. So again, returning to our figure, we have kind of a burgundy and olive color. So all in here, all I, I think <laughs> there's like maroon. Yeah, maroon. That looks pretty close to the color. And then olive. Yeah, they don't have that. Um, let's see, what greens do they have? You know what? I'm going to come down here and I'll do colors. And this will give me all 657 different colors. And maybe if I look through these a little bit, um, something will pop out to me. So there's like sea green, um, pale green, sea green, pale green. Let's try one of those. So pale green or sea green. Let's go with sea green. So I think it's a little bit more attractive green, but you'll notice I have them in the wrong place, that my maroon is going to false and my sea green is going to true. That should be the opposite. So I'll go ahead and grab maroon and plop that in there uh, and paste that in there. And so now we get our green and our maroon. And I notice it's not getting my theme classic because I forgot to put the plus on. So now we've modified the colors to be what we want them to be. How uh, do we get rid of that legend? Right, And so there's a couple ways to do that. The one that I uh, tend to use the most is to go to the geome that is plotting the data. So in this case, geome point, and then do show.legend equals false. And so you can add show.legend equals false to any of the geomes that you're using. You'll find that that then gets rid of the legend off to the right side. The next thing that I want to do is go ahead and remove that X axis and the label because it's not really contributing anything to the story. And so we're gonna do that in theme. So we'll do theme, and we can then do um, a couple things that we'll try. So typically when I want to remove something from a theme element, I will use the function element underscore blank. And so we'll do that here. And so here we can do axis dot and then when you type access dot, you'll see all the different arguments in theme, at least if you're using our studio, that you can modify that are subsetted under the access, right? And so I could do like access line for that line. And what I have is the access line dot X, and I can do element blank. Running that, I now get rid of that line on the bottom. Pretty cool, eh? So now we want to remove those tick marks. So now we can do access dot ticks and I'm gonna do dot X, and that's gonna element blank. Okay, so those ticks go away. And then we can do axis dot text dot X as element blank. Ah, and it's saying unexpected symbol in this, um, where it's got axis ticks, X element blank, and then axis text Y. I'm missing a comma. And if you hover over the red X, it says expected comma after the expression. Go ahead and add that. And so now we see we get rid of the text. Um, I can continue to do this to get rid of the title, right? So again, I could probably speed this up by doing, uh, not forgetting my comma. So I could do title 
to get rid of that. So I'm gonna do it a different way. I've already shown you all the different ways that you can remove text from a plot, and that is to use the labs function. So we can do labs, and we can then say x equals null, right? And put a plus at the end of that. And what that's gonna do is get rid of the label on the x axis. And so we see that's gone. And just to prove that to you, if I comment out that line, we get the compound back. And if we remove that comment um, and run it again, it goes away. So that's again, how you can remove components of an axis or really the full axis. That again, we could have done axis title x element blank and gotten the same effect. Now what I wanna do is go ahead and add in those horizontal lines we saw at zero and at 90. The one at zero was solid, the one at 90 was dashed. To do that, we're going to use a geom and we're gonna use geom h line. So that's a horizontal line. And the argument we want is y intercept. So we'll do y intercept and I'm gonna give it a vector of values to see if I can do both of them at the same time. We'll do zero and 90. So let's run that and sure enough, that works. One thing I'm noticing is this line is on top of the data, whereas over here in the original plot, it is actually behind the data. And so to get it to be behind the data, I need to call geom h line before geom point. So running that now, you see those points, the green points especially are on top of that black line. I have a solid line at zero and a dashed line at uh, 90. And so I need to change the line type. And so again, I can come back up to geom h line. And this is an aesthetic for geom h line. If I want to apply it here, I can then do line type. And I can again give it a vector of, I'll say solid and dashed. And that will create a solid line and a dashed line. There's a variety of different dashings and solidness um, that you can use here. I'm gonna show you a slightly different way to do the same thing, and that is to give it numerical values. So if I do like one and two, that's gonna get me the same thing, but if I did say like one and three, you'll see that I now get this dotted pattern, right? And so I think solid and dashed is a little bit easier to read and interpret if you're kind of looking at it again later, coming back to your code in the future to understand what the line types are. So I'll go ahead and run with that. One thing I noticed is I think that the line uh, at the zero is a little bit stronger, thicker than at 90. And so I can, again, modify that doing something very similar, where here I could do, I think it's line size. And again, I can do, let's try like one and 0 0.5, that didn't work. So let's try size and see what, if it yells at me or if it does that right, line width. So it works, but it's telling me this isn't gonna last long, right? <laughs> yeah, so again, it wanted this to be line width. So running that, we don't get any errors and we get the right output. One thing I noticed though is this line is thicker than my Y axis. And so we'll come to that. When I look at the original, the, the lines in the original are very strong, right? They're much stronger than we see by default with, uh, with ggplot. So I'm gonna roll with that thick and we'll be sure to get a thicker axis and ticks on our Y axis when we, when we get to that point. The next thing we wanna do is, is to do that, right? Is to start worrying about the Y axis. Maybe one of the first things we can do is put our attention to the margin around the x-axis, you'll see there's a gap here and a gap here at the left and right sides. There's also a gap up at the top, right? Our plot doesn't end at 100. It also doesn't end at minus 100, but we'll get to that. So we can get rid of those gaps by using the scale x continuous scale y continuous. So we can do scale x uh, continuous. And here we're gonna use the argument expand. And here I'll then say expand equals false. Oh, it's not a logical, it's a vector with two or four elements. And so what we can do in there instead of false would be C0 comma zero. And so now you see on the left and right side that it uh, there's no margin, right? And so we can do the same thing for the Y axis. So how do you think we do that? Yes, <laughs> with scale Y continuous. So now if we make this Y, we now see that we have no padding up at the top, right? Or at the bottom. But <laughs> we don't have our y-axis going from negative 100 to 100. So we wanna take that on. 
And we can do that within scale y continuous as well. And so here I'm going to do limits and we'll do negative 100 to 100 and we'll then do breaks equals and I'm not I can make it a vector like I have here or I can do seek negative 100 to 100 uh, by equals 50. So now what we see is that we get those limits back at negative 100 to positive 100 and we're going in increments of 50 like we saw in the original plot. So this y-axis title isn't right. Let's see what it was. It was inhibition of bacterial growth percent. And so we can modify that in labs like we did with x. So we can do y and we can do inhibition bacterial growth percent. Run that and we're good to go. So the next thing I want to do is modify the y-axis components to be stronger, to be more bold. And yes, we're going to come back to what we did here, but instead of using X, we're going to use Y. And so I'm going to go ahead and copy these elements down and I'll switch out my X's with Y's. All right. And we're not going to use element blank. We're going to use element text. Okay. So to make sure everything works, let's go ahead and rerun that. And it is upset because Ah, it's upset. It's upset because I used the wrong function. So the line and the ticks, instead of element text, gets element line. If you're ever not sure which one it takes, you can go to your help and then type in theme. And this allows you to modify components of a theme. And you'll see like axis title X, um, also axis ticks was here, right? And so then you can scroll down to the description of the arguments and it'll tell you here, right? So like axis title takes element text or axis text takes element line, okay? So now let's run it, make sure everything works. Wonderful. But what we wanna do is we wanna make those lines uh, stronger. So what we can do for element line, for axis line y, would be to do line width. And before we used one for that geom h line, let's see if that will work here. Cool, that worked. <laughs> and so then we can do the same thing for our ticks. Running that, we now see that we've got uh, those strong ticks, they look kind of stubby. And I noticed that over here, they are a bit longer. So what we could also do here would then be axis.ticks.length, uh, and then we'll do dot y. I guess we don't need to specify the axis because there's nothing on the x axis. Um, and then what we'll notice here is that this then takes a unit uh, function, right? So we can then do equals unit. And then the unit function, we give it a number and then the units that we want to use. I'm going to say like 10 uh, PT, uh, so 10 point, and we'll see what that gets us. So that's quite long. Let's maybe drop that down to, to five. And I think that looks good. Uh, was that the default? Nope, that's a little bit longer than the default. So I think I'm happy with the way that looks. Now let's think about our text on the, the text on the ticks as well as the title. And so we've got axis text Y, and so we wanna make it bold. And so now we can do face equals bold. And so now we see that's bold, and we wanna do the same type of thing, but for the title. So axis title, bold, and that's bold. Great, so this looks pretty good. So one subtle thing that I am noticing is at the top, um, my circles are getting clipped, right? So they're, th they're big, and so they then get clipped at 100. And I want them to be circles, right? The other thing I'm noticing is that on the y-axis, my points are falling behind the line. And so I wanna fix both of those. So the first one we can fix by going and adding chord Cartesian. And we can look at these arguments, and here we can see that we can set the x limits, the y limits. We could also set the expand um, here as well. Um, and we can also see that there's an argument called clip. So what clip equals on means is that we're going to take the, the boundaries of our plot and anything that falls outside of that, we're going to remove, right? So we could say clip equals off, add that in. And now we see that we've got our circles extending um, that kind of fall on 100 or just below 100 are now expanded to be full circles. And so that I think is pretty nice. What we also notice then is down here on the y-axis, 
that it becomes more obvious that we have points that are falling right on the axis and getting hidden by that axis. Returning to this plot, you see that those points are actually on top of the axis. So how do we get that to happen? Well, basically, we're going to have to make our own y-axis. So let's go ahead and remove the y-axis line. How can we do that? Well, up here, we used element blank on axis line x, and we can do the same thing uh, down here at axis line y in place of element line. So if we run that, we now get rid of that y-axis. So how do you think we could recreate that axis line? Well, if you think that's a lot like a geom h line, you're right. <laughs> but we're going to use geom v line. And so we'll come back up here. And because we want it to be under the points, we're going to call it before geom point. So we'll do geom v line. And I'll then do y intercept equals, um, I think it's 0, but we'll see. It might be 1. And it's not happy because it's not, it's not y intercept. It's x intercept. I think I heard somebody say that. So thank you. Good on you. And I'm still having problems because I forgot a comma somewhere. Ah, I've got a comma instead of a plus sign. All right. So now what we see is, sure enough, we have our line um, under the points. Um, I have it at 0. I don't know that I would notice if it was at 1. Um, I think it probably is 1 because the data start at 1, right? Like the uh, back up here, the compounds start at 1. So I think I'll use x intercept equals 1. And then we need to do line width equals one to have the same thickness as everything else. That looks good. Um, one other thing that I'm noticing that is perhaps just subtle to me is that there's a little bit of a gap between the tick and the line. So I think what I will do to fix that, um, that annoying little thing, and that's probably only because I've got the lines drawn so thick, is to come to my uh, scale y continuous, where I have my limits of negative 100 to 100, what happens if we make that go from negative 101 to 101? My thinking is that we will still have the breaks at negative 100 and 100, but we're going to trick the line into being a little bit longer. Bingo. I think that looks pretty good. And of course, you could play with those values um, to adjust if it's too long or not. Um, but I think that looks really good. So I'm pretty happy with how these figures compare to each other. I think I've done a pretty good job of recreating it for not having the same data and not knowing the exact color um, of this. Um, if I, I'll go ahead and probably find it later and put a note here for you all to know what the exact color is, but it doesn't really matter. What's more important is that we could change the color away from the default. So I think we've done a number of really cool things in here. We talked about making a scatter plot using geom point and ggplot. We talked about changing the color based on a continuous variable by making this strong uh, variable that we then used to map to our color. Then, of course, we went ahead and we changed the color uh, to, so that those above the threshold were maroon and those below it were sea green. We then talked about changing the x-axis by removing a lot of the elements um, and showed that we can get rid of a label using x equals null. And then we talked about uh, the margin around our axes, around the data on the axes. Set, turn that off using the expand argument in scale x continuous and scale y continuous. Uh, for what it's worth, you can also do that in chord Cartesian. Then we went about adding our annotation lines for this solid x-axis line at zero, as well as the dashed line at 90%. And we did all that with geom h line. Um, really nice, effective way to kind of show boundaries or limits of detection um, in your plot. Then we turned and talked about the y-axis, and we got the y-axis to have the limits and the breaks we wanted, and we used some of the theme elements to go ahead and make that bold and to change the title of that y-axis to match what the original authors had. And then finally, we turned off the clipping so that we could see the full circle of the points that were right up against the boundary of the data, as well as drawing our own y-axis so that the data are on top of uh, the lines. So all in all, I think there's a lot of cool stuff in here from very basic elements of using ggplot2 to more sophisticated things like making your own uh, axes or modifying the themes.
I hope you found this really interesting. Again, strongly encourage you to subscribe to my newsletter as well as to this channel. If you have a plot that you think is really cool and you would like my narrative commentary on it as well as a video of how to make something that looks like that, by all means, shoot me an email at pat at I've got the email address down below as well. And I look forward to seeing you next time for another episode of Code Club.